Well, good evening. If you're starting to tune in to the Facebook Live Bible Study, uh, again, this uh, tonight we've got uh, Becky is here, but she's uh, she's multitasking again. She's got a missions committee meeting underway at the same time, so she's going to be on her laptop running a Zoom meeting and um, hopefully won't be talking out loud too much to her missions people. She's sitting right here with me in my study. Um, Somebody was complimenting my library the other day in a meeting. I may have told you all this before, and wow, you've got quite a collection of books. And uh, I told them those aren't real books. I just took boards and painted the backs of books on those. Um, it does impress people a little bit when they see all those all those titles <laughs> back there behind me. But it's uh, it's good uh, to see everyone coming on the on the Facebook Live feed here tonight. We've uh, we're almost to the to the end of Acts, and I think I mentioned this before, but uh, it, it's time for you all to be thinking about another study for us to do. I'm thinking it might be good to do another one of Paul's letters. We did Romans, we did Corinthians. Uh, now we've uh, now we've done the Book of Acts, but I'm open. Whatever you guys would like to like to study next. Um, send some ideas and and uh, I'll, I'll try to catch those uh, on screen as you make your comments but uh, by all means we we want to continue on with this study and uh, <laughs> oh, somebody says you should see my workshop now it was uh, Jimmy Ovington one night that said I should do the study from out in the out in the workshop there's enough distraction going on without me being in a workshop doing doing a Bible study. But uh, if you have an idea about what you would like to see uh, our next study be, uh, send a, an idea or, uh, or just uh, email me if you'd like to do that or send me a text, uh, whatever. We'll, we'll pick a, a book. Next week we'll, we'll finish up. Let me look here before I tell you that. No, we've, we've got two more weeks to go. We won't finish next week. So we'll do... Uh, Next week, the next week, two more weeks, and then we'll we'll start something brand new. Um, there's some really cool Bible studies going on right now. Kathy Baker is doing one on fruits of the spirit. That's for women only. It's wow, and that's at ten o'clock on Wednesday. Turns out Wednesday is a a big day for Bible studies. Becky is doing. Uh, her food for thought. What are you doing that on now, Becky? Overview of the books of the oh, Bible. Oh yeah, overview of the books of the Bible. So you get a, a broad view of all the books. Uh, she's been working hard on that, and that's at uh, noon, right? Yes. Noon on Wednesday. So if they're interested, email me and I'll send them the link. Yeah, Kathy's is Facebook Live, so you just go to the Facebook page like you do for my study. But Becky's is Zoom. And she just said, if you're interested in being in her study, it's a women's study. Sorry, guys. But if you're interested in being in her food for thought for women, uh, then send her an email and she'll get you on the Zoom invitation for that. And then our study, of course, goes 7 to 745. Um, let's see. Uh, today was, a, uh, I'm going to take just a second to tell you this story. Today was a, a kind of a different day here at the house. We've been having problems with our router. Our Wi-Fi has been running really, really slow. The TV's been been kind of spooling, and so I had EPB check things out, and they said, "Well, you're, it, it, it's in your router." We did some diagnostics on it yesterday. So I remembered that I had bought a router, the the one that was just needing to be replaced from Best Buy, and I kept thinking of that today. I ordered another one. I got it online. They shipped it overnight, and, and uh, I got it configured today. But as I was working, getting it configured, I remembered going into Best Buy, whenever that was, four or five years ago, and and a young man came over to help me, and he says, uh, I told him I wanted a Wi-Fi router and what had happened to the old one. He goes, how big is your house? And I said, well, it's medium size, medium to large. And he picks up one and says, this works for medium to middle or large size houses. That's the one I'd recommend. And and so I, I said, well, how hard is this to configure? Because they used to be really a pain to set up. And he looks at me and he goes, a monkey could configure this router. It's that easy. And then I guess he remembered that, oh, my goodness, this is not what they taught us in customer service. 
<laughs> to say a monkey could configure this thing. So he made things a little worse then by saying, but if you have trouble with it, <laughs> give me a call. <laughs> I was so careful not to have to call him because he had intimidated me. Even a trained monkey, he said, could, could configure this router. <laughs> and I thought about that today as I configured this one. It's actually gotten even easier now. If you, uh, you, you download an app. This is Netgear. I don't mean to make it a commercial for Netgear, but you download an app, and the app kind of walks you through exactly what you do. So even I, even this trained monkey, could set this one up today. And I've got the TVs on it, and I've got the our laptops. Everything's working really well. Uh, okay, let's, let's get into our lesson. Oh, before I do that, one more announcement. I announced two Sundays ago that we had 1,850 people using our Christchurch app. And Jessica has been paying attention to it lately and, and emailed me earlier this week to say, David, that's over 1,900 now. That is incredible. The pandemic has helped us to push that app out there. But for that many people in our church or outside the church to have it is just awesome. And that's why I wanted to mention it. I pay for that app out of my evangelism budget. And it's cool that it's used by church members to register attendance, to see upcoming events, to see the daily devotions and all those things. But the reason I pay for it out of evangelism is I want us giving that away. So when you're telling someone about something cool coming up at Christ Church, um, we just had all the Christmas Eve music. We had the Christmas music. We had songs of Christmas. Uh, some incredible worship. Well, we're in the middle of a series now. Who do you think you are? As you invite people, let's say to, to worship with us, to enjoy this series that we're in. It's a powerful series. Ask them to, to just download the app and they'll be able to get information like that for themselves. I wish we had 2,500 people with, with uh, 700 of them being outside the church. Uh, and that makes it a good evangelism tool. So give that thing away. Uh, last week we studied about the last part of the second missionary journey, and then we studied about the entire third missionary journey. I'm always referring you to study Bible maps because it's good to see and trace out the places where Paul went. Um, uh, Paul last week visited in two major cities, Ephesus and Corinth. And I'm going to keep blabbing here, but I'm going to ask you a question so you can go ahead and be putting the comments in. It takes me just a little bit to see your comments. What was different about Paul's time at Ephesus and Corinth, both? These were, these were really unique for a particular reason. And uh, I hope I mentioned that last week. I may not have. Uh, I'll say, as, as you go ahead and answer that question, and as I keep talking, I'm going to say they were not kind of backwater places like Lystra and Derby and Iconium, uh, some of the early places that Paul visited. These are huge cities. Corinth was a seaport town. I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Lots of commerce with ships coming in and going out. Uh, people traveling across the little isthmus of Corinth over to Centria mm -hmm. to board other ships. Uh, it, it was... a uh, a really bustling place and a wonderful place to start a church. <laughs> Ephesus was on the uh, was on in Asia Minor, and Ephesus is a Roman colony, a beautiful place. We know that from the archaeology. They have uh, have dug down and found um, the remains of a theater that's been rebuilt. Even they found remains of a library and a. A huge, uh, we would call it a mall today, a place where people walked and visited and shopped. Uh, and so both of those were bustling, huge places where Paul would encounter a lot of, of, of people needing to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, many of which were Gentile. Now, you haven't told me yet what was unique about his time in Corinth and in Ephesus. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the amount of time that Paul was there. Uh, in a lot of places, Paul was like in Berea. It seemed like Paul came in. There was a huge uprising. Uh, Silas and Timothy said, you better go. This is not safe for you to be here. And so they hustled him 
out of town. He went from there to Athens, from there to Corinth. Uh, sometimes he would be a few weeks, maybe a few months in places like Philippi or in Thessalonica. But in Ephesus and Corinth, he was there for, and here's the answer. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. Uh, he was there for a long time. Uh, we think that he was in Corinth for 18 months on we this particular that, trip. We do, we and then he was in Ephesus time. for almost three so, years. Um, we get that from something that Paul says about, haven't I taught you this for the last uh, uh, three years? At the end of chapter 20, we read how Paul stopped near Ephesus and, uh, and, and uh, asked the elders of the church to come and to, to meet with him. And they did, and then from and and as he left them, uh, they were very very sad because Paul was was telling them, I may not get to see you all again. This may be my last time uh, to visit with you. So now I'm going to read Acts 20. Becky's uh, taking care of something on the her other call. When Paul had finished, this is Acts 20 verse 36. When Paul had finished speaking. He knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Becky, you want to read some? Sure. Uh, Acts 21, uh, 1 through 6. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tari, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them for seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. Okay, now this is... Uh... This is a difficult time for Paul. He's leaving places where he's been ministering, where he's been starting churches, and he's going, uh, actually, instead of going back to uh, back to where he started from, Paul is going to Jerusalem. Uh, he's, he's Remember, he's on a mission. He's been collecting money for uh, the church at Jerusalem, and instead of going to Antioch, where he started out from, he's headed to Jerusalem. I wanted to uh, read the end of chapter 20. Becky got back in... <laughs> to our study just as I finished that part um, because that was a sad goodbye for the leaders at Ephesus. Um, it's as if Luke wants us to have more of the details because it's part of Paul's, uh, it, it's like his free travel, his missionary travel is about to come to an end. And when something tragic happens, we can almost always remember the events, even what people said, the words they used, in the minutes leading up to that, or maybe the days of that event. Uh, we can all remember what we were doing when on 9-11, or we can remember, if we're old enough, what we're doing the day John Kennedy was assassinated. We can remember last words of loved ones. And I think it's that way with this kind of ending of a chapter of Paul's life. Uh, people are remembering well. Those Luke's remembering, helping us remember what happened in, toward the end. <clears throat> Kos, Rhodes, or islands off Asia Minor, and uh, Paul has, has sailed out through those. Patera is a port off the southwestern shore. They sail east, then go south, down below the island country of Cyprus, and then land at Tyre, which is a seaport town just north of Palestine. Now, uh, I want to ask you a question here. I want to see if you all are awake tonight. What is it, wherever Paul stops along his journey to Jerusalem, that people ask of him? 
People are urging Paul about something. Did you notice what it was? What are they urging Paul about? Not seeing any responses yet. There we go. Thank you. Uh, not to go to Jerusalem. A couple of you. Yes, thank you. Um, they know that what awaits for Paul in Jerusalem is going to be dangerous. It's going to be uh, bad for him, and they don't want him to go. And so Paul is, is, is going anyhow because he's on a mission. Paul has collected money from the different churches that he started, and he's on his way to Jerusalem to take that to them. Uh, don't forget who is with Paul. There's the, 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 his normal traveling team of Silas and Timothy, Luke, but there's, some, uh, there's also an entourage made up of members of all the churches who have given money. It, it's kind of like Paul's got this huge team of people who are going to be able to go and see exactly where that money goes. A good way to be transparent with the church's money. Becky, are you ready to read some more? Yes. Okay, 21, 7 through 9. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Polonmais, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried, doctor, uh, unmarried daughters who prophesied. Okay, unmarried daughters. <laughs> these are the prophets. And uh, we remember Philip, you know, who was one of the sons. Stephen was the one who was martyred. Philip was the one who, uh, who witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch on the way down to Gaza. Uh, and from there, Philip kind of disappeared. Well, he has, a, he has shown up now. Uh, in, uh, in Caesarea, and I, w I would remind you that here are four Christian preachers, all women. Sometimes we think it's radical that um, women can be pastors. Not at all. These, these ladies are prophets or pastors. Then Luke tells us about this prophet Agabus. We're not going to read that. Uh, there's quite a bit of our scripture tonight we won't read, but we'll try to cover everything. Um, he, he asked for Paul's belt. And he took that belt and tied his own hands and feet. Does anybody remember what the message was that Agabus, was this prophet, was trying to get across to Paul? In other words, he was telling Paul something symbolically by taking his belt, tying it around his hands uh, and feet, his own hands and feet. Do you remember what he was trying to say to Paul? In fact, they, they go right ahead and, and tell us. They make it explicit. And Becky, when you're ready, look up 21, 12 through 14. Don't start reading just yet. That'll be the next one. Yeah, I got it. Okay. What's the message that Agabus is trying to get across to Paul? Exactly. That in Jerusalem, they're going to bind you up. The, the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders there are going to bind you and turn you over to the Gentiles. That's exactly right. Someone else. Well, let, let's read on here. Becky's going to read 12 through 14. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. I want you to look back in verse 12 and see who it was who began begging Paul at Caesarea not to continue on to Jerusalem. They've done this uh, near Ephesus. They've done it at other stops. And now at Caesarea, there's a pronoun that's used there, we. This is Luke, remember, he's the writer, and he's saying, I joined in. 
I was begging Paul along with the Christians there in Caesarea. We were begging him not to go. And it's a, uh, I want to ask you, who made an earlier trip to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to be arrested and, and bound and turned over to Gentiles? Almost exactly the same things that are said here that you all have given me good answers. Uh, he's going to be bound, turned over to the Gentiles in Jerusalem. Who else had had that happen to them after making uh, a last trip to Jerusalem? Of course. Thank you. Uh, Jesus Christ. And there's a parallel. I think Luke wants us to see this parallel between Paul's entry and trip to Jerusalem <laughs> and that of Jesus. Uh, when Jesus told his apostles that he would be going to Jerusalem to be arrested and turned over to the Romans and, and, uh, and crucified, they said, no, surely not. Even Peter had, uh, had said that so forcefully that Jesus had said, get behind me, Satan. In other words, you're tempting me to not do God's will. Uh, these are parallels between Paul's going to Jerusalem and Jesus is uh, going there, uh, it shows us that Christians of all ages, of all different times, have had to pay for their faith. But I, I want to point out that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Jesus' death on the cross was unique. It's not like, well, Paul's is, is a lot like that. Maybe similar, but not anything like Christ. Let's not overcompare Paul with Christ. Paul would not want us to. All right, Becky, you ready to read some more? Yeah. 17 through 24, please, ma'am. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through this ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to their customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I find it really interesting and just a little bit strange that after telling us about collecting money in Thessalonica and Berea and Philippi and Corinth and Ephesus, all those places where Paul has started churches, uh, after telling us about men from those churches traveling back with Paul to see the money given, Luke doesn't even mention Paul going into the church at Jerusalem and giving them the money. Uh, we know that he did. Uh, in fact, it says he went before James, who's the leader of the Jerusalem church, and, uh, and met with them. Now, how does the church, now this is the Christian church, you might call it First Church Jerusalem, how does it receive uh, the news of all the new churches being started among the Gentiles? Give me a couple of answers here, those of you who uh, are quick on the response with, with uh with comments, give me some comments here. How do, how do the how does the church, the Christian church in Jerusalem, receive this news that wow, uh, Christians all over the world, Gentiles no less, are receiving the good news. Churches are being started, and the word is being spread. You see what? Um, in fact, Becky read it there. There's a. Uh, there's kind of two responses I see in that. Uh, what what uh, what do you observe in the in their response? Hmm. 
They praised God, exactly. The, the first response was to say, my goodness, can you believe it? Gentiles are coming into the church. We have, we have the church all over. They praised God. They were thankful for that. And then they go on. Yeah, they, they didn't want them practicing Jewish customs. They, they had already decided, this council at Jerusalem had decided, if you are a Gentile, then you do not have to become Jewish. Uh, but then they raised this other issue. The controversy had been that if you're a Gentile and you become a Christian, shouldn't you also eat kosher, be circumcised, obey all the, the laws, the ritual laws of the Jews? And the Jerusalem Council had said no. They just need to accept Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and don't practice some pagan things, sexual immorality, uh, eating meat sacrificed yeah. to idols, eating meat with blood in it. Uh, there were just three or four things that they said abstain from that. Now there's another issue. Uh, because Paul is going to many places and where there are Jews spread around the world living among Gentiles, uh, and Gentiles are accepting Christ, becoming Christian. But there is an accusation that Paul no longer lives as a Jew. Uh, Paul's, not, Paul's not a Jew anymore. Paul is telling them they don't need to be Jews anymore. Was that true? Was Paul saying to Jewish people, you don't need to circumcise your, your boy children. You don't need to eat kosher food. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to... to uh, go to, to synagogue or any of those things that mark a person as being Jewish. Was Paul doing that? Take a shot at that, somebody. This is, this is the controversy. Greg says no, and he used all caps. That Greg's exactly right. Paul was not doing that. Uh, in fact, uh, Paul would say to people, you think you're a Jew? I'm more of a Jew than you are. I'm a Pharisee. Uh, and then he would talk about his Jewish background. Um, as a matter of fact, there's something that Paul did that sometimes people question. Whenever he uh, met uh, Timothy, this young Christian man, born to a, a Roman citizen and a Jewish Christian woman, it's in Timothy had never been circumcised. And as an adult, uh, Paul circumcised him and took Timothy with him to be like his apprentice. Uh, you're right, Annette. He was not taking them out of their rituals. In fact, him circumcising Timothy was a way to show, uh, Timothy, I want you to be able to relate to Jewish people and to help them to accept Christ. So Paul would say, be Jews. If you're a Jew, be a Jew, but you're a Jewish Christian. If you're a Gentile, just be a Christian. You don't have to be a Jewish Christian. Just be Gentile. But Jews, don't give up your heritage. Don't give up those things that you have learned from a child. Uh, some of the Jews were feeling that Paul was doing that, and now they're feeding the rumors. The elders in Jerusalem said, you know, there's a way to solve this. Paul, if you would go and do this ritual at the temple, that would prove to everyone that you're still practicing as a Jew. Paul was fine with doing that. It seems like these four men must have been taking the Nazarite vow. It's a vow that you'll never have your head cut, you'll never drink wine, or you'll never even eat grapes. Uh, and you're dedicated totally to God. So Paul shaved his head, he went to the temple, he paid the offering for them, and took his vow, all part of showing that I'm still a Jew. I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian first, but I'm still practicing as a Jew. Ready, Becky? Yep. 27 through 32, please. And I want to ask you, before, as she's reading this, what is the charge against Paul? Listen for the charge and just put it up as a comment. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, 
He has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Thothmus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Thank you. Corinne's already had given us the answer that he had taken Gentiles into the temple. Now there was a, an outer court. Uh, around the temple where a Gentile could go. Um, but uh, only Jewish men could go beyond that court. And it was in that court that people said, we saw him take uh, a Greek, a Gentile, and that was punishable by death. Anyone who took a Greek or Gentile into the temple, that person who went, as well as the person who took them, uh, could be stoned to death. So, uh, and Tom Sutherland says it's assumptions. That's exactly right. They didn't see this uh, Gentile from Ephesus go into the temple. They saw him with Paul. Somebody else said, well, I saw Paul in the temple today. And so there was this assumption that he had taken the Gentile in. Remember, Paul's got a lot of Gentile Christians with him. They've come from all those churches that Paul started. Uh, a great command, uh, a great, uh, a great, a uh, riot broke out. People are trying to kill Paul. The Roman commander who's in Jerusalem at this time hears the commotion and he goes in to stop it. Now, the Romans would allow a lot of things to happen. They'd let the Jews do a lot of things. Riot and be violent was not one of them. And so the Romans go in to break this up. And when they do that, they bodily pick Paul up and carry him out of the crowd because the crowd was about to kill Paul. Now we see Paul kind of taking command here. Becky, if you would read 2137 to 222. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Hold on just a second, Becky. If you would, tell me what it is that the commander has assumed about Paul. He thinks he's somebody that he's not. And and Becky just read that he is surprised that he speaks Greek. Go ahead. Do you speak Greek, he replied? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Okay, so what had the Roman commander assumed? Who had the Roman commander assumed that Paul was? He sees the crowd attempting to punish someone, uh, beating them up. Uh, it looks like they were, they were going to kill him. Yes, he thought Paul was an Egyptian who had led a violent revolt. 4,000 men had come with him, and they had quelled it. They had put it down. But this Roman thinks that's the Egyptian who was leading it and that he's come back. He is shocked to hear that Paul uh, speaks Greek. Uh, and as Paul does this and begins to speak to the Roman commander and then to the mob, to some extent, Paul is kind of taking control here. Uh, he's going to lose control after a bit, but there's a while here that you can just sense as things quieten down, Especially when Paul says, uh, I'm a Jew, and he begins to speak 
in Aramaic. The crowd listens. They, they, he's speaking in their native tongue. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul reminds the crowd, I'm a Jew myself. I trained under the rabbi Gamaliel. That would be like saying, you know, I, I, uh, I studied under Billy Graham or, or any great, uh, in this case, a rabbi, Gamaliel, that everyone knew and respected. Uh, he said, I was so zealous for the law that I persecuted Christians myself. But then Paul tells about his experience on the road to Damascus and his conversion um, Paul told them that his conversion, he, he does, a, I'm, I'm not going to reread it because we know the experience, but from chapter 22, verse 6 through 16, Paul tells about his conversion. He wants the people there, Jewish people, to understand that I was a Jew and then I was confronted by Christ and I accepted Christ. doesn't mean I've stopped being a Jew, but it means I'm a follower of Christ, of the way. Um he wants to be sure that, and he says that later in the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ appeared to him again. We forget about that appearance and told him to go away because no one in Jerusalem was going to accept the good news from him. Paul's reputation, you see, is someone who was a, a, a zealot who was going to be killing Christians and arresting them. We keep him from being effective. Uh, where in verse 21 did Christ tell him to go? In other words, Christ has given Paul an assignment. Don't stay in Jerusalem. You're not going to be effective in Jerusalem. Instead, you need to go somewhere else so that you can have an effective ministry. Paul left Jerusalem immediately after that. Uh, for a while, he went to Tarsus, and then he was called up by Barnabas to Antioch and became part of that phenomenal church in Antioch. But where in verse 21 did Christ tell him to go? Thank you, Pat. He told him, yes, and Tom, go far away, get out of Jerusalem, go to the Gentiles. Go, and he's going to be going to Rome, but where Christ had ordered him to go was far away so that he could minister, preach to the Gentiles. Uh, the Romans were just ready to flog Paul as part of their interrogation, it's like uh, that's their way of using a rubber hose, I guess, an old uh, terrible police tactic. They were going to flog him in order to get the truth out of him. And Paul lets them know that he's a Roman citizen. Now, Roman citizens couldn't be beaten in any way, punished in any way, until they had had a tribe. Uh, the Roman army uh, commander said, that's interesting. My citizenship cost me a lot of money. <laughs> and Paul uh, said he inherited his citizenship from his father. In other words, if you're a Roman citizen, your children are citizens as well. In a way, that uh, says that Paul is superior to the Roman who had, had to buy his citizenship. It's another one of those incidents where you see Paul's citizenship playing into his, his ministry Paul was so perfectly suited to his ministry to the Gentiles. Uh, he was born and trained as a Jew, and so that helps him to relate to Jewish persons. He spoke Aramaic and Greek. See, we saw that here, Greek to the Roman soldier, Aramaic to the crowd, and a, a Roman citizen that kept him, in this case, from being beaten and perhaps executed. And then above all, he's Christian. Uh, the next day, the commander took Paul before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. This is the, in chapter 23. And really what he's trying to find out before the Sanhedrin is what is this guy guilty of? You all come up with whatever it is that you're going to charge him with. This is how Jesus was charged before Pilate. The Sanhedrin met. They decided Jesus was guilty of, a, of blasphemy, but the Romans didn't care about that. So they charged him before Pilate with claiming to be the king, a twist on being the Christ or the Messiah. When Paul is before the Sanhedrin, um, some of you may have read this already, and I hope you have. He does something to kind of throw them into disarray. What does he do? 
<clears throat> uh, this was really crafty of Paul. He goes before the Sanhedrin, and they are a very diverse group. They were, there are 70 people on the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, and, uh, and they begin to debate what's Paul guilty of, what can we charge him with, and before they can come up with a charge, Paul does something that really messes with them. In fact, it throws them into a divided uh, disarray. And they're unable to come up with a charge. The disarray was so much that the commander pulled Paul away and just put him in jail uh, overnight. I don't see an answer yet up on the screen about what, uh, what Paul... Uh, what Paul did during this during this meeting of the Sanhedrin, uh, perhaps you didn't pick up on that in the in the reading, but uh, what Paul did was he picked up on the fact that, okay, in this group are Sadducees and in this group, oh yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. there we go. Uh, he's he he brings up a very divisive topic. Yes. Uh, he he notices there are Pharisees among them who believe in resurrection. There are Sadducees among them who do not. Paul just simply says, I come before you today as a Pharisee. <laughs> I'm one of you. And the Pharisees immediately identify with him. Uh, some of them, yes, thank you, Tom. And whenever they do that, the Sadducees uh, who don't believe in resurrection start going at it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Corinne. Pharisee, not Philistine. <laughs> Very good. So now the Pharisees and the Sadducees break out in a huge debate, and Paul can just kind of back up and watch it. Uh, very smart move on his part. One might even say crafty. That night, uh, the Lord told Paul that you will testify for me in Rome. Paul uh, had always wanted to go to Rome on his way to Spain. This is not the way he had thought that he would get to Rome. Also overnight, his sister's son, Paul's nephew. This is the first time, maybe the only time, we learn that any details about Paul's family. But this nephew has learned of a plot to assassinate Paul whenever they bring him around again to the Sanhedrin. And so Paul sends his nephew to the Roman commander who goes and says, they're going to assassinate your prisoner. And so the Romans take Paul during the night to Caesarea. Luke gives us a lot of detail. He mentions how many horsemen or cavalrymen went most of the way to Caesarea because they were really concerned. And then the cavalry goes back into Jerusalem and the foot soldiers continue on their way, taking Paul to Caesarea. Um, he, he sends a letter, the Roman commander sends a letter to the Roman governor. The governor lives, it's a, a man named Felix. Pontius Pilate was no longer the governor, now it's Felix. And Becky, would you read that letter? It's Acts 23, verses 26 through 30. Folks, this is what we'll close with tonight. 26 through 30? Yes, 23, 26 through 30. Claudius Lithius. To His Excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law. But there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. Okay. Um, we're going to read next week about that trial and another trial. Uh, in fact, there will be another governor. Paul will be tried before different people, all leaders, all important people. And we'll read about that next week in chapters 24, 25, and 26. So if you would, uh, please read those three chapters. 
and uh, and do let me know what you'd like to do. Maybe next week as we start our study, give me some ideas of books of the New Testament that we might study together. Tonight I want to close with a word of prayer. So if you would just bow with me, let's pray together. Gracious God, whenever we open your word, you seem to always be present. Your Holy Spirit comes among us and helps us. Thank you for your help tonight. Thank you for the opportunity and the technology that lets us do a study with like 20 people studying along with us. This is so beautiful, and we thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you be with our nation these days, be with those who are in, in, uh, in office now, and be with those who are about to assume office. Help all of our leaders at national, state, and local levels to turn to you for wisdom as they serve. And help each of us, help each of us to turn to you for guidance and wisdom in our daily lives. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody. Been good seeing you all. Been good having you in the study.